Hello everyone. Tonight we're going to be talking about the different types of graphics that we use in landscape architecture and landscape design and also about the structure of how we compile these projects. So first of all, why do we bother to go through all of this difficulty in creating this graphic communication? Um, we talked about last session that this idea of having this idea of design and then putting it on a two-dimensional piece of paper, handing it off to someone else, and then having them interpret our design and actually build a three-dimensional space is kind of fraught with um, things that can go wrong. Um, and I really like this example of something that can go wrong. Um, in the Western culture, we do tend to use plans to build. In other cultures, they don't. So for those of you who might be familiar with the industry, um, you may know that we tend to cloud areas of our construction drawings that have changes in it. So the contractor can look at each page and identify where a change has been made. So for example, in the little graphics clip above, um, it looks like kind of a kitchen. Um, it could be like the uh, legend for maybe that stove has changed and so the designer has clouded it. Um, the picture below is actually what happened when this was installed. Um, this is actually from my colleague who worked in China, which is not typically a culture that builds off of our Western style of plans. And so when the contractors in China received those graphics, um, they cr thought that they should cut out a portion of the slab in the floor above them and they did a very careful job meticulously cutting out a cloud above the kitchen. Um, so those are the things that of misinterpretation that can happen when you're maybe dealing with an area that isn't used to reading plans. But for the most part, we go through plans because in Western culture, we resolve conflicts and problems on paper before they're actually built. And I will attach a kind of just a funny clip of construction things that go wrong. And most of them are from other countries where they maybe don't use this Western style of development. So hand graphics um, are used in the profession and generally today we use them really for conceptual work, it might be for internal team communication. Sometimes we do hand graphics to present to clients. Um, some clients really like a hand drawn graphic style. Um, there's definitely a more artful feeling to it. They also um, have told me that they don't feel locked out of the design process. Sometimes when they see very formal computer graphics, they feel like the design has progressed so far that they no longer have the ability to chime in and contribute to that. And we talked about last week that it's important to have a foundation in hand graphics and be able to communicate ideas on the fly when a computer is not available. And again, I've had design charrettes where we've three days in a room and not one computer is available and you are relying on hand graphics to get by. So here's an example of a plan view and a section. This is something we might use for early um, client coordination. Um, in this case, this was a big uh, commercial, kind of a, a a uh, big facility and this was a big turnaround oval right at the entry and we were just exploring different ideas of what could happen in this big entry oval and you can see with the scale of the cars this thing is a massive oval so it had many different iterations of going through the contractor of you know or in the owners of first they wanted a big water feature there and then they found out the water feature was going to be $150,000 and then they didn't want a water feature anymore and now we, we're doing a, you know, a big oak tree in a boulder and trying different things. But so on the left, you see a plan view. And then on the right would be a section cut through that. So you kind of get an idea in plan and section what is happening in that space. We will be working a lot in plan and section in this class with hand graphics. 
Um, and here's an example. Um, I worked on this project oh, probably over 10 years ago now. This was an expansion of Ramona Airport pre-recession. Didn't make it through the recession. It was kind of abandoned after that. Um, we really went in to a uh, design review meeting with the design review board of Ramona. And we brought a very, you know, kind of first pass graphic. We were intending to just present the idea of the uh, the project to them and get their feedback. And our intent was to go back and update the plan and, and produce more formal graphics and then, you know, get the plan approved. And it was interesting because this was enough that the community loved it and they voted unanimously to approve it. And so that was a win for the team and for us, made us feel pretty good. Um, we'd done a lot of research and really tried to reflect what the community was looking for. But here's an example of a larger site with plan view graphics, again, hand rendered at this point. Um, another kind of rendering style, the last one was done in markers and pencil, and this one's just being done in the, the pencils. So part of your materials is buying um, some good quality uh, kind of coloring pencils so that you can do rendering work like, like this. Um, this particular firm that I worked for years ago has a really artful rendering style and they always render in pencil. So I think you'll find that different offices have different graphics that are identities to their to their office and some work in hand early on and then switch to digital, some work in digital all the way through and you as a designer will ultimately have to adjust to whatever the office standard is. And then we have a bunch of different types of computer graphics that we produce. Um, for my world as a landscape architect, we tend to mostly work in computer graphics. Most of our work is in the construction documentation package. That's the technical drawings um, that are produced after a concept drawing, which is kind of those earlier rendered colored examples that you saw. Once those are produced, we go into construction documents. And a multitude of programs are used to produce computer generated graphics. Um, they're used for both conceptual and technical Draw, you know, construction drawings. Um, right now, the industry standard for technical drawings is Autodesk AutoCAD. Um, and that's going to be an important uh, program for you to learn if you're planning to work in an office. Um, they are going to have AutoCAD tests these days and see how proficient you are. It is a really difficult program to learn. So don't get frustrated, um, especially certainly if you're taking it this semester. Um, I know it's being offered uh, remotely. It is a very heavy engineering program. It is not all that user friendly. So I, there were lots of tears involved when I had to learn AutoCAD many, many years ago. Costs can be a factor for these programs. They tend to be pretty pricey. So here's an example of these are planning graphics. Back in the day, um, we were involved in a new development that was being proposed that at the time was called the Eastern Urban Center, and today it's called Millennia. So it's kind of fun to see it um, going in the ground. I actually live in Chula Vista, so I drive by it all the time, and it's just been quite an adventure to be involved in, in some of the master planning of the villages um, early in, in the day before it was all built out almost. Um, and in this particular graphic, what we were trying to show is that the development is a smart growth kind of center. And then we were locating where other smart growth centers were around the region and also the context to Mexico to cross the border. So um, this particular graphic, we used geographic information systems and Photoshop to create this one. Um, here's a community development park plan. So um, in, for the firm that I did this work for, we always did our conceptual graphics 
um, in the computer. So very time consuming, um, but we were working primarily on big kind of community development projects, big, big expensive uh, projects to, for clients to pay for. So that, that was in the budget to do fancy computer graphics. Um, this was kind of for Central Green Park. This again would be a plan view development. And then this particular site had very steep slopes. So last session we talked about section elevations really start to show that change in grade. So this is a section right through a piece of that park you just saw, and you can see the grade changes um, down from street level and these stairs that you have to navigate to get up into the core of the park, at least on that one street frontage. The rest of the community did um, you know, relate to more direct access into the park, but this was connecting to actually Old Town Temecula right there. And then this would be a perspective drawing. So this was, this was kind of a fun project because we um, researched the history of Temecula and then made each park have a theme about the history. So Temecula in the past was a cattle drive location and they would drive the cattle there and then load them on the train. Um, so this was kind of reflecting that heritage and having these core 10 cattle go marching through the landscape and these kind of splash pads for kids to play around at the Central Park and very much designed in that Rancho era. So, um, but that's a perspective drawing. And back in the day, we used CAD and Photoshop to do these. SketchUp was not a thing when I would work on stuff like this. Um, SketchUp is now the go-to standard for these kind of um, quick, I'm not saying this was not especially quick, but um, pretty intuitive, easy to use 3D modeling that is pretty easy to learn. Um, and it doesn't have quite the technical backing that some of the more involved 3D programs have, have developed in this since this time. So here's an example of SketchUp. This is for a little pocket park in an urban area. Um, what's nice about rendering in SketchUp is you can import your CAD line work and you know really just kind of scroll around and get an optimal view of your park to show it off to its best, best extent. Um, so pretty easy to use program, some great tutorials um, on YouTube and lynda.com. If you're not familiar with Lynda and you're struggling with the computer programs, you can sign up for a free library card for the County of San Diego, and they have an online access to Lynda. Normally it's about 30 or $40 a month, but lots of SketchUp tutorials on lynda.com. And then current day um, building information modeling like Revit, or Civil 3D are primarily being used at the professional level for 3D renderings. And that's because every team is building their models and then they merge all their models together and they can run checks on the program. And it might identify if pipes are like going through a structural beam. So a lot of those problems can be resolved before the project's actually built. And that's why a lot of um, municipalities and uh, agencies are requiring the team to be working in building information modeling. So here's an example of a construction plan. Um, I had the good fortune years ago to work on the Elephant Odyssey project. So this is an example of the construction plan from that. So this would be the technical working drawings where we're telling the contractor how to build the site. Um, here are some sections. Now these are construction sections. In this case, this is through the different pools uh, that the elephants use um, and showing the kind of depth of the pool and where the thickness is of the kind of shot creek edge would be. Um, here's what we call some details. So um, a couple cross sections of the pool, but also these little drinker um, features where the elephants there's water piped into them. It's like they can go and get fresh water. 
Here, a lot of you might have seen the little baby elephant in the paving. I hear that a lot of people like to take pictures with that. So um, I worked on that concept early on. And this was actually supposed to be a little water feature, but it got too expensive to build, so they cut the water feature part out of it. So when we think about designing, it's really a design process, and there's a series of steps or actions used in making making that happen. So you can have natural processes like, like photosynthesis or erosion, and then artificial processes, which are buildings and mining and things like that. So design process is critical. Um, we want to organize our information, have an orderly approach to um, problem solving, and explain the solution to clients through the use of graphics. And here's an interesting exhibit of a, of a electrical pole right in the middle of the street. So again, a lot of cultures don't design with things on paper, and you see more of these kind of conflicts pop up. So in the design process, we're analyzing the situation, developing ideas, selecting a best alternative, and implementing the idea. So design process involves a lot of parties. Um, we look for research and preparation. That might be the client and the designers working together. Then we as designers lead the design, or hopefully we leave. Sometimes the clients are a little bit too involved in that, but you know, just work with that personality. Um, construction documentation, that is the working drawings that go to contractors. Um, implementation, the designers working with the contractor to actually build it. So lots of processes involved in um, back and forth communication. Um, maintenance is like post design, post installation. How is that um, design, how's, how are the plants establishing, how are the materials holding up? So hopefully you as a designer get a chance to keep revisiting your sites and seeing which plants are performing well, which materials are performing well, and being able to constantly kind of update your library of design to pick materials that are gonna hold up well and plants that are gonna do well. And there's always hopefully an evaluation process, and hopefully that's between the client and the designer, kind of at the end of the project. So um, when we're getting ready to design, we're gonna do some research and preparation we might meet the clients. Um, they'll probably ask us questions. We'll ask them questions, um, show them our portfolio. We might give them a contract, which includes our scope of work, our schedule of deliverables, and the cost of design services. We might have to prepare a base plan. Um, if we're on a smaller project and we don't have a surveyor to give us a, ba a survey, we might have to create our own base sheet. So we might have to measure our site ourselves and create that document so that we can start designing. We're always gonna conduct a site inventory and that's going out to assess the site conditions, what kinds of regulations um, that might be uh, impact the site, like uh, is there ordinances from the city? Are there local guidelines for the community? What's the character of the community? Are we gonna try and tie into that? And then we might develop a design program, which is really listing all the requirements. And it's kind of like making sure it's like a checklist. You know, are we um, hitting the wants and needs of our client and us? So early on in the design process, we work on functional diagrams, our bubble diagrams, our lynch diagrams. These have a lot of names. These are really freehand bubbles that show the relationships of major spaces and elements within the design. No drafting here. This is all freehand, very loose. We will work on this skill in the next coming up soon. Um, but a key skill to kind of get us started with the design process. Preliminary design, we're kind of roughing out our design, converting those bubbles into forms and outdoor rooms and general shapes. Um, and starting to, to, to get our, what materials we're gonna use, what plants we're going to use in the spaces. And then we might refine that early plan to, to create an illustrative conceptual plan. Um, and that's 
usually at the single family residential, this might include plant materials and hardscape materials because at the residential scale, single family residential, a good contractor would be able to take a drawing to this level and be able to build it. So many times at small scale residential, you don't have to go beyond this into the full working drawings like I would normally do for my projects. And construction documents are what um, my office works a lot on. We tend to work on bigger projects. We don't take a lot of single family residential. Uh, on rare occasions we will, either because the project is interesting to us or, you know, it's a friend of a friend or somebody that, um, that our former client, we had one, the former client's house burned down in one of the fires. We were already working with them. So again, it's not my realm. I feel like I like to focus my education on you guys and not necessarily educating each homeowner I come across. So I find it education intensive. And so I tend to focus on bigger projects. So we tend to produce construction documents and these um, tell the contractor really how to build the project. So um, I am a design only firm. Uh, that's what I own. I like to focus solely on that side. We don't construct anything. I like to say I stopped digging holes a long time ago, um, but there are some firms that are design build and those would probably hold a, uh, instead of a landscape architecture license, they're going to hold a C27 landscape license at the minimum. Um, and they might have designers in house or landscape architects in house, and they work collaboratively to design and build a project. So sometimes design build um, doesn't need as much documentation because you're working within like in house. So there's more that can be coordinated with work, work crews versus when you're design only, a lot of times we release documents and multiple contractors will bid on it. So we want to minimize confusion. It's not in-house. So we have to be a little bit more thorough when you're design only. So these are the kinds of packages that might be in a landscape set for a design um, project. Again, this is that, that big, um, it's like a biotech campus. I showed you those quick sketches for the big oval. You'll see that I think in this drawing, but here's a demolition plan. You can see the building is being pushed out. So we were demolishing some of the existing patios and a lot of the trees around the perimeter so that the building footprint could enlarge a little bit, but also saving a lot of trees out in the parking area and, and not trying not to mess with more than we needed to. Um, this is the construction plan. So it's going to show the contractor where we're adding new hardscape. We've got some enlargements in some of these key court kind of entry, vehicular entry areas, um, because this is a pretty big project. I want to say it's probably, I had to guess, a 15 acre project. So pretty large over on Campus Point. So here's what that final oval became it just became bands of planting and rock in there but you can see we've got the paving pattern all demonstrated and some of the different details for planters and things that went in there here's just some details on wall screening so we had a big um, kind of the plant for all of the air conditioning and so we had to screen that wall because this conference room came out you know, and looked at this ugly service yard wall. So we tried to make that a little bit more attractive. Um, irrigation plan. So that's important in our region where we have to add supplemental uh, water to keep plants alive. And a planting plan. So all the new plant material going in. Again, you can see we're trying not to disturb the parking and really just add the new pockets around the perimeter of the building. So construction and implementation, um, for me, we generally, our clients would release the package and put it out to bid. 
sometimes we're uh, as a designer we're uh, we're the representative to our client to oversee the bids and recommend a contractor kind of making all the bids apples to apples because you get apples to oranges when they come back and then you've got to go through and see what this person's including this and this one's not including this and they're going to substitute this so trying to get a more of a um, comparison um, construction is actually the building of those hard elements <clears throat> implementation might be building softscape these are nebulous terms um, so planting and irrigation would be implementation versus construction might be hardscape walls um, and then Hopefully, as designers, we're hired to perform construction administration duties, which means we're out on site. We're not inspecting, but we're overseeing the installation to make sure the design is going in keeping with our vision of how the finished product would, would look. And there is some confusion over that process. Sometimes um, people want to control exactly how it's built. And sometimes we do that, but for the most part, we trust the contractors um, to make adjustments that are needed to make sure that it works with materials they're using, or maybe they have a lot of experience with, you know, pouring retaining walls. And they, instead of having a CMU retaining wall, they want to make it a cast in place retaining wall. Um, at the end of the day, the finished surface, maybe the the stone covering on that wall is what what I'm concerned about most is the look of the project and to make sure that it's gone in in a way that's going to last. Um, but, you know, there are some field changes that generally can happen. There's some terminology specific to this phase. Um, an RFQ might be is called a request for qualifications that is sent out usually by the client to either make sure that the contractor is qualified to bid. So they'll do a first round and say, submit your qualifications. If we think you're qualified, we'll invite you to bid on the project. They might also do this for designers. Maybe a city is designing a new park. They'll send out a few a requests for qualifications to firms they wanna target, and then they might invite them to bid. An RFI is a request for, for information. That can happen during the bidding period or the design period or the construction period. It means someone needs more information to be able to solve a problem. So um, in my world, we might ask an RFI to the client if, if something's unclear in the direction we've been given. Um, but a contractor could also ask us designers an RFI if they find maybe our plans um, Maybe when they started to dig the irrigation, they hit a big utility um, that was very shallow. And so they can't implement, you know, maybe there's a wall footing that will conflict with that. So they might ask us, what are we gonna do? Help us, here's your RFI and help us redesign this area so we can actually build this. And hopefully the contractor is in communication with the designer to ensure questions and concerns about the projects are answered. I always tell my students, you, you want to get along with the contractors. Um, most of them are very, very knowledgeable of what they do and they build things every day. Um, so if there's a problem with your design, you want the contractor to feel confident that they can call you up and have a discussion about their concerns. Um, so be nice to your contractors and try and answer them quickly because they're out there on very t short timelines. So, that's really important to contractors that things not sit for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. Maintenance is the last piece of the puzzle. Unfortunately, we're not involved in aftercare as much as we should be, but this really affects how a site looks for the long term. You can have a really beautiful site that's poorly maintained and it's gonna look like garbage, or you could have just a mediocre site that you designed that has really wonderful maintenance that's gonna look stunning. So um, hopefully you get the opportunity to be involved in maintenance, but you know a lot of these, these topics are things that we look at if we're invited back to see the project. And then ongoing evaluation. So looking at 
the project and making sure it is maturing um, how we intended to. Um, I'm looking for how are the materials holding up? Are the plants growing well? Is it functioning? Those are all good to circle back and, and learn from each and every design. Okay, so we're gonna be working a little bit on scales tonight. Um, and we're also gonna be doing line weights for our lab, or our assignment. So projects are typically drawn to scale. We talked about this a little bit last week. So we wanna make sure that there's an accurate um, proportion. Um, and I would say this is not accurate proportions. Like all these little plant symbols are the same size. Now it could be that they're all the same size in reality, or it could be that they've just drawn the symbols the same size and it's not reflecting their mature size. We always want to reflect there's our plant material at, at nearly full size. I generally draw at 75% of full size um, to make sure that we're not over planting an area. So we have um, architectural and engineering scales we will use in this class. So here's an, an example of architectural scales is it's got the fractions on the edge. Um, and what this means is at 1 8 scale, every eighth of an inch is equal to a foot. So this upper um, row of numbers is where we'd start measuring. We would measure the end of our line at zero, and then we would use that those top numbers to count up how many feet long that we have. And then each scale you can see comes with this small little bar. This is actually like a mini, mini ruler squished at eighth of a scale. So I could measure to the nearest inch at this scale with this little graduated um, mini ruler. So at a, um, architectural lays two scales, one on top of each other on the same blade. So if you were to slide all the way to the other side of this, right, you would see quarter inch at the top. And you would see where the zero is, is the lower string of numbers. So you would line your line right up on that zero and then you would use these to count how long your line is. If you weren't ending on exactly a foot, then again, you have a little scaled ruler to use to get to the nearest inch. Engineering scale is a decimal system, not metric, but decimal. So we still use feet, but it is in factors of 10. So engineering 10 scale um, notice it's listed at one inch is equal to 10 feet. Here, architectural, we would say an eighth inch is equal to one foot zero inches. So we are showing that we are measuring to the nearest inch. Engineering, we don't have the ability to measure to the nearest inch, so we generally don't show them. So here's the blade that is labeled 10. This would be our 10 scale. And each of these, one inch is equal to 10 feet. So that's about an inch right there. And if I had a line that went all the way to here, it would be 10 feet. Now it's not marked with a 10 because this is a decimal scale. So if I wanted to measure at 100 scale, I would have to add, I could say one inch is equal to 100 and I'd have to add two zeros. If I'm measuring at 10 scale, I would say, um, this is 10 feet, right? So I just add one zero. I could measure at a thousand scale, which means I would have to add here three zeros onto the end of it. So that's the decimal component of engineering. And so at 10 scale, it's breaking up this inch into 10 pieces. And so I could put my line right on the edge of the zero and measure all the way over to whatever feet that line is. Each of these hatch marks would become a foot. Okay, and if you've grown up with the metric system, and I'm, and I'm confusing you by references to inches, I apologize. In our assignment today, you'll have a little bit of a conversion, but know that one inch is equal to about 2.54 centimeters. Okay, and then if we're going to draw shrub symbols with our new shiny circle template. Um, we are going to use our scale or our ruler 
to find a circle that's about the right size of a di diameter shrub. So if we're drawing at eighth, eighth inch scale and we want to draw a three foot diameter shrub, that would be three one eighths of an inch for each foot. One eighth plus one eighth plus one eighth equals three eighths in diameter. So we would measure which circle on there equal three eighths of an inch. And that's what we would use to draw that shrub to scale. 24 inch canopy tree would be drawn as a three inch diameter circle. So it's 24 eighths, eighth inches when we get to three inches. So you can, um, if you're doing a planting design, you can kind of draw your hardscape in and then start just roughing your different plants in um, and fitting them into the landscape at their mature size or 75% mature size. And um, well, let's go back. So I'm not going to go back. Um, and then that would prevent us from overplanting. And then at the, we also, as part of our drawings, we might include title blocks. So they, these title blocks identify relevant project information like the name, the project, project name, project address, who's the design firm or the and the designer working on it. What's the date of the design, uh, the project number, if there's a project number from the city, and a licensure stamp if it's applicable. And so you can see that we have different title blocks we might use. Um, this is our course title block, so we'll talk about that in the future. We'll, you'll get very familiar with this. Here's kind of a construction package. So this is actually a D sheet title block. So some cities require this format where it's all clustered in the middle. This might be one that's more typical to our design firm. It's kind of the title block I use on your projects. So you can see it's everything's more spaced out here. 